Thank you for inviting me to uh, speak at this conference. I will speak to the topic, new social patterns, old structures, comparative perspectives on how diversity challenges religious education, RE, in Europe. Um, yeah, that works, good. In the field of RE, the issue of increased societal religious diversity is, I believe, the most discussed topic. Indeed, this was the reason why I entered into the field as one of the first in Norway with a, with a religious studies background, at a time when educational policy shifted to inclusive RE subject for all. The background was a long tradition of Lutheran Christian education where it was the reformation that motivated the introduction of schooling for all in 1739. Um, as the Danish king who ruled Norway at that time converted from, from Catholic to Protestant religion. Christian education was for a long time the main aim of education, but over time RE allocated a place among other school subjects. Between 1974 and 1997, a secular worldview alternative existed, though the majority had Christian RE. From 1997, we got one subject for all in the Norwegian comprehensive educational system. There is only a limited right to exemption from activities and not from knowledge content. This has been controversial and parental complaints by secular humanists were brought before the European Court of Human Rights with a verdict against the state of Norway in 2007 that parents' rights were not sufficiently respected. Following this, the national curriculum and the legislation were adjusted. The present name of the subject is Christianity, Religion, Worldviews and Ethics, K-R-L-E. The specific mention of Christianity in that name was taken out after the verdict in Strasbourg, but was reinserted after a political shift to a conservative right-oriented government in 2013 against strong opposition. I had graduated from religious studies at the University of Bergen and came to Trondheim in 1998 where I have been working with educating RE teacher, teachers for this subject since then. Um, the situation back in the second half of the 1990s was that this new inclusive subject was introduced. Now all religions should be taught. In effect, this was five world religions secular humanism as a worldview, and philosophy and ethics. Most colleagues in teacher education at the time had Christian studies or theology background, and my first responsibility became teaching the other religions. Many were looking to England because of a similar inclus inclusive subject there. The interpretive approach um, uh, is pioneering work by a team at the U University of Warwick to solve the challenged, challenge posed to RE by increased societal plurality. Children and parents had greater variety of different religious backgrounds than the selection of materials for teaching in school rep schools represented. This could mean that a child is taught about his, her own tradition in a way which is alien to him or her, or learns about religion in ways which is not useful for understanding more about own or others' religions in the present diverse society. The internal diversity of the grand religious traditions became obvious as the work by the Warwick team was based on ethnographic studies into the lives of for instance, Hindu children in Britain. It gives a certain focus on the lived side of religion, which is probably closer to children's experiences than tenets of faith or the history of the traditions, which is often the traditional content of school learning. 
The approach is anthropological in its perspectives, but combine this with profound pedagogical groundwork that put the child in center of the attention. Uh, yes. Um, Jackson, Jackson dis dis uh, distinguishes between religion as a grand tradition, groups within those traditions, and individuals. This pedagogical approach encourages an understanding of religions as dynamic and evolving, countering essentializing representations. Three main principles in teaching religion in a plural context is to reflect on representation, what is selected as the content of teaching, interpretation, how materials is interpreted by students, and reflexivity for students to reflect on, wh uh, what that, on that which is presented to them in relation to their own experiences and backgrounds. The interpretive approach is possibly the most well-known theory of religious education and has spurred widespread interest and debate. Uh, Leni Franken revisited the theoretical foundations of it in an article from 2018, arguing that it is, possible, it is a possible way out of ongoing debates about dilemmas of what are neutral grounds for inclusive RE. She quotes Jackson's 1997 book, The Interpretive Approach. One problem for religious education is that religions and cultures are rarely represented in a vibrant, flexible, and organic way. Ari tends to treat religions as discrete belief systems and cultures, when they are discussed at all, as separate, bounded entities. And from Jackson's uh, 2004 book, Rethinking Reli Religious Education and Plurality. Oh, here are the quotes. Yeah, easier to follow. The second quote from the 2004 book, Rethinking Religious Education and Plurality. The content of RE is not simply data provided by the teacher, but includes the knowledge and experience of the participants and an interactive relationship between the two. The specialist religious education teacher working with children from diverse backgrounds needs the professional skill to manage learning that is dialectical. If teachers can have the right degree of sensitivity towards their students' own positions as well as to the material studied, and can develop appropriate pedagogies, then a genuinely conversational form of RE can take place, which can handle diversity. We see here that there is no demand for teachers to have a particular religious or theological or religious studies background. It is a demand for teachers to have professional skills. Now, a little bit about the signpost might be something you know, but um, in my preparation for this paper, one of the questions which Francesca uh, suggested to me was, is, what is the role of scholarship? Initially, it could be helpful to make the distinction between role vis-a-vis -vis policy and role vis-a-vis -vis educational practice. Guy Shea has found that since the 1990s, research in the field of religious education in the Nordic countries has had a focus on the complexity of religious plurality, including teachers' strategies to handle this. Therefore, the debate on plurality and RE is quite advanced, but this has little impact at the political level, where the focus is rather on whether or not Christianity has a special role in the country's cultural heritage. Regarding the role of scholarship on a European level, I see Signpost as a substantial effort to bridge that gap of research, policy, and practice. The background was a discovery, discovery that policy that the countries of the Council of Europe had already agreed on was not followed up, uh, in, up nationally. Thus, in Signpost, Professor Jackson tried, tries to explain it 
in a form which is applicable for practical usage. For instance, an important distinction is made between understanding religions and religious understanding, recognizing that outsiders' and insiders' perspectives has distinctive qualities. Both may be important for understanding religions as an aspect of all and others' culture. Strangely, uh, issues of religion has often been left to one side when issues of intercultural education have been on the agenda. From such a perspective, it is, a matter of, it is also a matter of how religion could be brought into that mix of intercultural education. Um, but that is not to say that that is all that RE could be, or indeed is. So has signpost affected policy on national levels? To a very little degree, it could seem, according to a recent comment by Professor Martin Rothgangel in the 2021 book, Islamic Religious Education in Europe. I will get, get back to that in a minute. Has it affected practice? Despite the effort to bridge the gap, the signpost could be seen as aiming at the policy level. But it is translated to 13 languages, and there are teacher training modules based on it available at the European Vergeland Center. If it is being read by actors close to practice, like teachers and teacher educators, they may pick up points seen as relevant in their own teaching practice, even if it is not integrated in the national policy in a formal way. It could thus have an impact on practice. Turning now to comparative perspectives. When I came into the field of religious education at a time of shift to an inclusive model in Norway, many were looking to England for inspiration. I think two things caused me to do a PhD with Professor Jackson. The first is when I encountered the interpretive approach that gave me directions. And the second is I wanted to understand the English context where some impulses came from. It soon became apparent that I was going to do a comparative study, but it was not apparent how. In the process, the methodology that I developed to conduct the study became a main point, put forward in the title of the book. The background for the methodology is multidisciplinary, collecting perspectives from comparative education, comparative religious studies, and some pioneering works in comparative religious education. One point is that it is about the study of internationally shared problems to have a supranational perspective, meaning a view transcending the often very intense national debates. It aims to focus on the impact of internationally shared problem on national processes. It is analytical rather than purely descriptive aiming at comparative analysis. I claim it is a methodology suitable, suited to explain variation across national cases. Uh, I argue that three dimensions should be considered, supranational, national, and subnational processes. This is one of two core ideas of this methodology, which is illustrated by this model. Here we see those three dimensions. Um, and this is combined with four levels, which is really four levels of curriculum from curriculum theory, John Goodlad. In the model, this is A, a societal level, B, an institutional level, C, an instructional level, and the experiential level, what students actually learn or experience. Why the levels? It is to secure validity in a comparative study through thoroughness in exploring national history and local school systems and acknowledging the complexity of curriculum. I have argued that together these make up a map of domains of relevance for learning in RE. 
I distinguish also between formal and informal processes, where verdicts at, at the European Court of Human Rights are example of examples of formal supranational processes. The societal changes in the population's relationship to religions are examples of informal processes. I also want to draw your attention to the arrows in the, in the model, illustrating how this is not a top-down model of how policy affects practice, but rather illustrates how impulses can go either way. For instance, it was the increased numbers of immigrant children in Birmingham, UK, which spurred John Hull's famous 1975 innovative interreligious syllabus. I call these impulses bypasses. Impulses from signposts on teaching in national or local context, even when the national policy does not reflect those ideas, are also examples of bypasses. The book series, Religious Education at Schools in Europe, maps all European countries, RE in all European countries. All six books are out now. Part two, Western Europe, I was challenged to give a comparative perspective on RE in those countries represented in the volume. Belgium, the Netherlands, France, Luxembourg, Scotland, the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and England. In the analysis, I utilized the three dimensions and four levels methodology. I call this chapter, New Societal Social Patterns, Old Structures, How the Countries of Western Europe Deal with Religious Plurality in Education. This title reflected the results of the analysis. In this article, I considered the traditional uh, religious landscapes, what the societal plurality in those countries consists, consists of today, and current conceptions and tasks for RE. While striking differences in the conceptions and tasks for RE was apparent, challenges discussed in all chapters related to increased religious diversity. And yet again, the, the way that these challenges are dealt with in each setting is very different. Uh, what kind of responses to religious diversity that exists depend on what nation, national, uh, on, um, national religious history in the tale of the history of the nation, religion is allocated a specific role, and this history is described as deep, cultural, and intersecting with the identity of the nation. For instance, from the chapter on Belgium, uh, religious education in Belgium in the public realm of the school is dealing with this broad European and global diversity but because of the small space of the country and its deep history, the discourses on religious education seems to be even more intense. Thus, a pattern of same but different came to the fore, that the state school religion relationship in history or the tale thereof seemed determined for what possibili possibilities was accessible in each context to address the increasing societal diversity. This left me pondering, because even if writing this chapter had expanded my view, uh, this finding was based on one chapter from each country, while the no England-Norway comparison was much more thorough about national context. So I called a symposium at the Nordic Conference of Religious Education in 2019 to explore this matter further, and the result became a special issue of religion and uh, education um, published in 2021. Uh, here, scholars with experience of comparative studies explored the question how religion in different contexts, including history, impact religious education systems. 
Attention to methodology for comparative studies is also followed up in this issue. In my original study, I had found that specific similarities between England, English and Norwegian RE were somewhat incidental. Pluralization of society is put forward as a reason for change to inclusive models in both countries, but whether change could happen seemed to depend on na nation-specific factors, and particularly the history of church, state, and religion, or the tale thereof. This is why a combined focus on the supranational and the national is necessary. Why did changes to inclusive models happen in some places and not others? Uh, and this is actually explained by Lenny Franken's <laughs> article in this, in this issue. My work with new social patterns or structures had revealed a pattern of increased religious plurality in the population documented by statistics and school systems that form and forms of RE that seem to be resisting adjusting to those changes. In the introduction to the special issue, I therefore present this as a hypothesis for further exploration, that new social patterns reflecting the present plurality are not sufficiently accounted for in educational systems as they rather reflect the traditional religious landscapes. Um, and these are the articles. Uh, and I will go into some of them a little bit. Uh, in uh, Jonathan Donne's statement, Archaeology, Archaeology, it is about digging out how something became, uh, becomes possible, and here focusing on the Christian ecumenical movement as a supranational process that made uh, inclusive uh, RE possible in England and Norway. It illustrates how history affected what happened, but also what might happen today. In Eastern Europe, inclusive RE did not so far become possible. Typically, RE is catechetical. In Martin Rothgangel's The RE Puzzle of the Weisegrad Group and the Answer of Collective Memory, he compares RE in Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. They share a history of being part of the Habsburg Empire. He thus explores some other kinds of structures. In Sibren Midema's Apostlude on Adequate Methodologies for Comparative re Research regarding the relation, religion, worldviews, and education, he notes how this, uh, he refers to Shea's, uh, Shea, who has noted a contextual turn in research on religion and education. We have seen in religious education, this is a quote, is it here? No, it's not. Right. We have seen in religious education um, research an increasing emphasis on the re relationship between object of study and the social and cultural surroundings. This has been discussed not only as a methodological issue, but also as an epistemological issue. Um, <coughs> this is from my introduction then, a little bit. When history is described as deep and connected to religion, identity, culture, I have used the concept of national imaginary to describe this, to catch the fact that the idea of history is not identical to what really happened. And I refer her here to Benedict Anderson, who describes imagined communities, and Charles Taylor, who refers to this when he writes about modern social imaginary, um, imaginaries, a whole book from 2004. A country's religious history is often very particular and related to the idea of the nation. In the process of enlightenment, belonging to modern nations became bundled together with religions in different ways. However, during the second half of the 20th century, religion and nation, national identity has become unbundled for a significant amount of people. For instance, today, Islamic Norwegians, for Islamic Norwegians, nationality is not relevant 
for religious identity. For others living in that same country, however, it is relevant, but in the face of the pluralization, it becomes important to negotiate new ways of integrating religious and national identity. For instance, through a rhetoric that all share in the Christian cultural heritage, if not the Christian faith. I believe this bundling and unbundling of religion and nation becomes particularly visible when looking at debates about RE in national school systems. In Church, State and RE in Europe, past, present and future, Lenny Franken explains why some structures are so hard to change. Both religion and schooling is often integrated into nations' constitutions. Behind the legislation is often historic conflicts from the past, laid to a form of rest. Real structural shift to models more suitable to the new situation therefore often require constitutional amendments. Since there is often no political will to do so, the gap, the gap to worldview realities among the student population widens. She even finds that sometimes pragmatic shifts happen with creative interpretations of constitutions. The pragmatic solutions she, reveal, she re reveals showcase the gap between pedagogies to adjust to societal realities and formal structures of education. It seems that traditional religion is holding their grounds uh, both in integrative and separative forms of RE. In integrated models, as for instance in Norway, it is still Christianity in the main, often with reference to its importance in, as cultural heritage. A problem is that Christianity is represented as Norwegian rather than global, thus Christian diversity is not well represented. In effect, now, neither, for instance, Islam nor the often privileged Christian religions are thought as living, negotiated, present, and global religions, which the students in today plural, globalized, mediatized re reality already meet. And maybe there will always be a gap, but how wide can it be before RE no longer makes sense to the general population and thus politically? Human rights issues. Considering the discrepancy between existing educational systems and societal developments, how are these systems justified? As it turned out in the new Social Patterns All Structures article, ensuring human rights was central to all, justifying almost diametrically opposed systems. As we know, several cases concerning RE have been brought before the European Court of Human Rights. These court cases bring uh, attention to the situation for minorities. Uh, Hendek and Fancourt uh, find that such verdicts are used selectively by politicians of different nations just to justify their own politics. In their article, The Effects of Judgments by the European Court of Human Rights on religion, Religious Education in England and Turkey, they see how England, having no verdicts against them, while Turkey has two, is a major difference in how important such international jurisprudence becomes in the national debates. While all nations are in principle bound by the same verdicts, the effects and use of them in national politics varies greatly. Now, what secular are we talking about? Increased diversity of worldviews is not only about religious, religious worldviews. There is also a significant increase of people identifying as not religious. Uh, entangled in processes of pluralization, there is also a process, or maybe processes, of secularization. But what does that mean? Research into the worldviews of those claiming to have no religion reveal nuns, 
to hold very different views that may or may not be of a spiritual nature. They may reject or be unfamiliar with traditional religion. Sometimes religion, the religion-secular divide no longer makes sense to them. They don't know about it, so that their worldviews could be described as non-binary. In France, we find an elaborate debate on the meaning of secular, but how context-sensitive are ideas about secular? For instant, instance, in Eastern Europe, it might be associated with a communist past, whereas this is not the case in Norway, where secular could be seen as neutral. In his article, Comparing Through Contrast, Reshaping Incongruence into a Mirror, Christian Niemi explores how important context is for the meaning of concepts like secular and religion. He describes how secular in India is nothing like secular in Sweden. That is uh, that his research questions were framed from a Swedish idea of secular and religious caused friction when studying Ari in India. Through the act of comparing, comparing and exploring that friction, he gains new perspectives on Sweden when his aim was to study uh, religious education in India. Now, Islamic religious education. I was encouraged to comment on Islam as part of my presentation, and I will do this based on a recent publication, Islamic Religious Education in Europe, a Comparative Study from 2021. The background for, for Franken and Ghent's book was the increased number of Muslim students in schools across Europe and increasing attention for Islamic RE not the least in the perspective of discourses of radicalization, politicization, and securitization. A question arising uh, from this is what the relationship is between what state and society expects from Islamic religious education and what Muslim communities expect. By initiating in an ontology with a comparative perspective, they create an overview of forms of an embeddedness for IRE across Europe. The book contains 14 country reports, and in addition, there are some short commentary chapters on issues such as feminism and Islam. Four, ma uh, four main forms of an embeddedness of IRE are identified. Uh, IRE, Islamic religious education, into religion. This is found in state, sc state schools in Belgium and Austria, for instance. Uh, education about Islam is found in state schools in, for instance, Sweden and Norway. Um, uh, is, uh, Islamic education is found, of course, in Islamic schools, which you can find, for instance, in Netherlands and France. And you also can find Islamic religious education in confessional Christian schools, for instance, in Belgium, Netherlands, and Germany. Through focusing on Islamic RE, some general points regarding RE is illuminated at the same time as Islam specifically gets some much needed attention. In the words of uh, Hendek's book report from 2021, the faith of RE determines the fate of IRE in a country, a point which could not be caught without a comparative perspective. In my short chapter, comparing in brief Cyprus, Netherlands, and Denmark, th this illustrates uh, quite clearly how national context determines what kind of RE there is. If Christian RE is confessional, IRE and other kinds of REs is confessional. If the history is of strict separation of state and religion, there is, and there is no RE, and there is no Islamic RE in schools, as in France, and in areas uh, with traditions of Protestant churches where inclusive RE developed, we, find, we now find uh, education about Islam as part of inclusive school subjects. What we can actually claim to see in a comparative perspective 
is how parts of European history that regulated Christianity through historical big bickering back and forth between state and religion created a certain deal for Christian education specific to each uh, state or nation. In each case, the deal for Christian RE is expanded to other religions, such as Islam. But maybe that doesn't fit so well. Maybe this needs to be renegotiated to fit Islam into European history in its own right. A point may be that more of Europe's history of different religions uh, needs to be written into and negotiated with regard to the story of the nations and its alleged deep history. Uh, in effect, European cultural heritage. Neither Islam nor Judaism, for example, are new in Europe. Far from it. Rothgangel's comment, Islamic religious education in Europe and European uh, recommendations, as a new, yeah, that's just a slide, isn't it? Yeah. Um, this, um, his, this comment is relevant for the question of the role of scholarship on policy and practice. Referring to advice from the signpost and also the Toledo guidelines, uh, for instance, he observes that almost no reference to this European advice is made in any of the book chapters. While in the named recommendations, religion is seen as a cultural phenomenon that there should be teaching about for integrative purposes. This is often not the understanding of the organizers of Islamic religious education. He lists a number of possible reasons for this, but one is that in uh, the often quite hostile social debate, uh, Muslim pupils feel vulnerable and in need for a safe space away for, from prejudice and discrimination, for instance, among peers in Muslim schools. This increases segregation at the cost of dialogue and integration. Also, the mere complexity of different national contexts where this advice is integrated or ignored is named as a challenge. How well does the advice fit? This strengthens the view that attention to context is also needed. I will now turn my attention to an alleged crisis in English RE. Uh, in England, there has for several years uh, been a murmur of crisis. Um, this crisis is on the agenda of Bista and Hanum's book from 2021, The Forgotten Dimensions of Religious Education. In my reading, I find that a forgotten dimension is perspectives on religions as lived, what it entails to live, entails to live meaningfully with religion. However, a main point is how the dimension of religion is lacking in theories of education, while at the same time, uh, theories of education is lacking in theories of religious education. If this crisis is not solved and no one understands the point of RE anymore, there is a danger that it will be taken out of the school curriculum, which I think is actually part of the debate in England now. For Hanum, as I understand it, a main point is, um, of both education and religious education is that it should enable young people to act in a diverse reality through subjectification. This refers to Bista's series of education where he distinguishes between qualification, socialization, and subjectification. In chapter six, where Bista interviews Panjavi and Revel, the focus is on essentialism, where Islam works as the perfect example of why this is problematic. In the current political climate, we find essentialized ideas of what Islam really is. For instance, is Islam compatible with democratic values or British values? It is impossible to answer this question fairly with a yes or no, because Muslims shape Islam and Islam shapes Muslim, Muslims. It is not a static phenomenon, but diverse uh, and 
context sensitive and evolving. And still, in schools, such questions may be posed to pupils. You might, might find examples in textbooks. Joyce Miller uh, was part of a commission on religious education that worked on this crisis and published their final report in 2018. While doing investigations for the commission, she did observe a lot of good quality teaching, but the problem was the lack of coherence to educational structures that supports it. This, seemingly, uh, this is seemingly part of the same tendency that I identified in new social patterns, old structures. What she asks for are structures that support more open exploration of religion and worldviews as phenomena, including as lived realities in people's lives. Um, does the alleged crisis in English RE apply elsewhere, for instance in Norway? That would depend on whether teaching of world religions continues with essentializing representation of them, or whether a kind of teaching could be facilitated where open exploration of religion and worldviews can happen in a way which is uh, seen as meaningful to students and meaningful in the wider context of the purpose of education. With regard to new national curriculum in Norway from 2020, a general point is that subject learning should be meaningful in relation to overarching aims for education. This is specified in three interdisciplinary topics public health and mastery of life, democracy and citizenship, and sustainable development. It also encourages a more open approach to knowledge, where students are meant to explore issues uh, and not just learn pre prefabricated facts. This kind of learning is called deep learning. In this model, we uh, we got a national and international access and also a general education and specific subject access. Both educational policy in general and specific to RE are subject to international trends and exchange of ideas. This is what is illustri illustrated by the national international access. When, uh, when there is, uh, then there is also a point how specific school subjects are embedded in the wider context of education. This is part, um, particularly obvious in Norway now, where um, a new element is how subjects should contribute towards the three interdisciplinary topics. Deep learning is described in the, the curriculum material as follows. Uh, school must provide room for in-depth learning so that the pupils develop understanding of key elements and relationships in a subject and so they can learn to apply subject knowledge and skills in familiar and unfamiliar context. In, in other words, using what is learned. For each school subject, their key elements are replacing detailed list of content, learning content, and for ARI, those key elements are knowledge of religions and worldviews, exploring religions and worldviews with different methods, exploring existential questions and answers, being able to take another's view, and ethical reflections. Together with Guy Shaya, I argue that insofar as studies of religion and worldviews in schools has a lot to contribute to the three interdiscipl interdisciplinary topics, RE in Norway, Norway could be seen as strengthened. Maybe through this, a crisis of the sort discussed in the English scene can be avoided. However, that all depends on what happens with it in practical teaching. Turning now to my concluding remarks. In this presentation, I have given an incision into the topic of religious education and diversity with a focus on comparative perspectives. 
Towards the end, I commented on some recent developments in England and Norway. Uh, though I have highlighted how new societal patterns uh, outrun educational structures, that is not to say that changes in RE or school uh, is not ongoing. They are, and so are intensive debates. I have kept the question, what is the role of scholarship in mind? In my darkest hour, I think that the role of scholarship is to be not to be read and largely ignored, be tangled up in disagreements, and especially when it comes to religion. However, scholarship on RE does provide useful insights, and in a less pessimistic vision, and through, the, through wonderful opportunities such as today, it may be seen to bring the world forward. What is religious education? Is it a school subject with various names? Is it the purpose of education as it once was in Norway? Is it education into faith or membership or identity, religious identity? Is it education about religions and worldviews in today's world? Is it a means to increase tolerance and understanding? Is it a means to understand oneself, the world and others? Is it a safe space for dialogue on such issues as religion, worldviews, existential and ethical questions? RE is probably all of the above and more. The role of scholarship in the field of RE could therefore be named as bringing forward new insights of potential usefulness for different kinds of religious education in different contexts. Personally, I see the aim of developing students' understanding of own and others' religion and worldviews in today's world as pivotal. I will argue that RE is not merely an area of applied science, but rather an area of research in its own right, which is contributing to debates on major issues such as what is religion, what does secular mean, and to the broader debate on diversity and religion. Thank you.